Mm-hmm. And I mean, and that's the thing is that what's so great about you know people in general is that we can adapt. We can have that ability to do so. We just got to be open to change. We're not too far away from each other and how we're looking at things in different viewpoints and ideas. But that, um, and it's it's that commonality that I think that is really missing in this day and age. You know, I, I don't know when. It became a bad, dirty word or taboo to work together and use the word compromise. Because, you know, they're all people and they're all part of the system to make it great. And I think that we got to remember that when we're talking about people in general is that uh, we're all people. So if you give someone a viewpoint or idea that's antithetical to what they've they've experienced, they're going to be shocked by it because it's going to be like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's not the way I see the world. I, I've lived this world. What are you talking about over here with that as well? Well, hey, Impactivist, I want to introduce somebody to you today. Somebody that I have a lot of respect and admiration for. Um, this guy has achieved some amazing things. He is a, he's an exemplary uh, servant leader. He is driven by purpose and faith and passion and integrity. He's lived what people call the ministry of public service. My friend Rudy Mateer has turned politics into purpose. And there's this idea of doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people that really inspires us to be the best version of ourselves. So I want to introduce you to him. Rudy is the son of Haitian immigrants. He's the first of his family of generation to graduate college. He received a law degree from UT Law. He has been involved in a range of things from teaching at-risk children to co-authoring an an honor code at UT. Been involved with partnerships with local law enforcement. He has uh, created pro bono clinics for legal advice for veterans of our military. And he is a Dallas Cowboys fan. So you know that we have a lot in common. You know, know, we we share the same burdens. How about Um, the Cowboys? (laughs) That's right. And listen, y'all, the Texas Bar Association, <clears throat> the Austin Bar Association has given him more awards than I can keep up with. He has been called a rising leader. I am blessed. I'm fortunate to call him a friend. Uh, his giving heart and infectious smile are unmistakable. And I fully expect to see him in the Senate or the White House at some point. So when he, when he speaks, I tend to listen. So please welcome hands down, and the best dressed councilman I know, my friend, Rudy Mateer. Hey, Rudy. Oh, Thanks man. for being here, man. Oh, you, you know, you're, you're too kind about that. You talk about, uh, well, there's a couple of things. One, it's kind of weird to hear some of the things that you discussed that I did, because, you, you know, I'm like you. You just try to help where you can, and you just try to make a, a discernible difference, and, you know to people that frankly oftentimes either don't have a voice in the situation or feel like they don't have a voice and you're able to, you know, show them the way and the path of that. So some of the things you brought up, I was thinking to myself, it's like, wow, you know, especially I hadn't even thought about the UT honor code, you know, <laughs> probably close to 15, 20 years or so. So that was, that was interesting to hear about that. And two, okay, you have an infectious smile and laughter. Look who's talking. <laughs> Okay, I mean, dude, you're, you're completely on point about that. That's one of the, the greatest things that you have going for you is, is your, your, your positive personality, your positive energy, and just be able to go ahead and effectuate change just in all sincerity by the person that you are. That's awesome. So, you know, what does it say? Iron, iron, sharpens iron, something like that along those lines. There right. <laughs> well, listen, I appreciate that, man. I, uh, so for people who, I, you can tell I've been stalking you, I mean, following you for a while. Um, uh, um, but we, I guess over the past couple of years, we've kind of gotten to know each other, uh, you know, on a more personal level than just watching me, watching council meetings and seeing you around town and uh, your involvement in the community. So for people who don't know you, like I know you, um, we're talking about the Cowboys family, right? Um, speaking of family, take us back. So for people who don't know you, um, can you share a little bit about, like, I know that your parents immigrated from Haiti, uh, 72, 74, or something like that, and met at the public library in New York somewhere? Wow. Is that right? Okay. Um, one, you're impressive. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> and two, it's true. Yeah. So my mother came to this country in 1972, uh, finished her uh, senior year, you know, in Brooklyn. Um, didn't speak a lick of English. She only spoke French. So it was definitely something that was um, hard for her to become work where she wrote English, but she didn't speak English very well. So she had to go do with that. My dad came to this country in 74. And um, my parents met, just like what you said, at uh, New York Public Library. Uh, my parents are, you know, uh, it, where I think I get my nerdum from is from my parents. My mom, you know, always loved chemistry. My dad, you know, engineering. And so they met at the library and, you know, they were studying and working from there. My older brother was born in 1977 in Brooklyn. I was born in 1980. Then we moved about six months later to um, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Little brother was born in um, Worcester. Little sister was born in Framingham. And it was in 1986 that we came down to Texas. My dad got a job. He had um, gone to uh, he had gone to trade schools to to get his engineering degree. That's why you know one of the things I've been really emphasizing enough is that we need to redefine what um, college college looks like because I think that if you really expand the definition of what college is and you're looking at trade schools and other aspects where people can get um, apprenticeships or other locations around school, they can make a big discernible difference in, you know, in the impact of not only are the lives of their families, their loved ones, but the community in general. My, I look at my dad. My dad went to Worcester Polytechnical and I think about, you know, how big of a difference it was him being able to, you know, be a waiter, you know, and he, he was waiting full time while at the same time going through trade school and getting his degree and getting his engineering degree. But when we moved down to Texas in 86, you've got to remember this. Um, you know, Dallas was the top TV show on TV at the time. So we thought everybody <laughs> owned horses and rode, uh, you know, and had cowboy hats, cowboy boots, and everything like that. So I still remember my dad bought us our first um, pair of cowboy boots and the cowboy hats. And we got to go to the Fort Worth stockyards and the stock show and everything else over there as well. And, um, you know, I've been down here for 34 years ever since, and there's not a better place, I think, um, honestly, not only in this country, in the world where I'd rather live, I'd rather be than in Texas. Yeah, that, you know, that's, that's really interesting, man. I, I read somewhere that um, you had a strong Republican mother and a strong Democrat father. Oh. Is that true? Yeah. yeah, and you know, and it's funny that you say, and you're, you're exactly right. One of the things that I tell people, and this is why maybe, my viewpoint in general, you know, I haven't really thought about until you brought that up, you know, and why I see people as people in general. My mom has been a strong, strong Republican her entire life. My dad has been a strong, strong Democrat her entire life. But I can never tell you one time whatsoever when they argued over politics. And they've been married for 46 years. Wow. <laughs> and that's, you know, and, you know, and that's the, maybe that's the part where, you know, I, I always think to myself, I'm like, we're not too far away from each other and how we're looking at things and different viewpoints and ideas with it. Um, and it's, it's that commonality that I think that is really missing in this day and age. You know, I, I don't know when it became a bad, dirty word or taboo to work together and use the word compromise and, you know, in government. I mean, our whole, our whole system's made for that. And it's definitely something, you know, I, I don't want to jump too, too much further into the other parts of my life, but, you know, as a council member, I've taken the council, you know, when we had a conversation, one of the biggest things that happened when I first came on council was a debate whether or not we, we start off the, um, the meeting with a prayer. And at that point, the council was 3-3, it was deadlocked before I came on, and there was, you know, in fact, saying, no, we shouldn't have a prayer. Other people say, absolutely, we should have a prayer. Well, me being me, I said, well, why don't we just have a moment of silence? Because then after that, those who, who want to pray have the opportunity to pray. Those who need to reflect, reflect the words to me, they can do that and move forward. And we were able to pass that and do that. And to me, that probably personifies my approach to not just um, policymaking, but life in general, is that, you know, let's try to work together to try to go ahead and figure out things as opposed to looking at the worst of one another. You know, something that I, I, I've carried with me in my life that um, I, I really try to apply in everything that I do is to um, do not attribute to malice what could easily be explained by misunderstanding. 
So quit thinking that people are their first instinct. Oh, Rudy's being a jerk. This is exactly why this is happening right here with that. Maybe Rudy just doesn't know. And, you know, and, and, and then when you educate Rudy, oh, okay, I completely get where you're coming from on something like this. That makes perfect sense. And, you know, I, I, I don't understand. Well, I, I, um, well, I think the media plays a role with it. That's another story in society in general. But I, I, I feel like we need to get back to that basic tenet. I truly believe, um, and that's me, I know there's some people uh, who worship other faiths, you know, um, Buddha, Allah, sort of that worship from there. To me, you know, being Catholic and being a man of faith, I truly believe that we all are created in the Lord's image and that truly people are good. Most people are good and people want to see people doing good. So instead of thinking that we need to, you know, worry, apprehense about people's actions. Why don't we take it as in a good light? And then if something doesn't, if something happens, we see it otherwise, that's fine. But, you know, it's like someone said before where they said that someone's going to earn my respect. No, you have my respect because you're the, you know, the son or daughter of God, period. Now you can lose it. Absolutely. But, but I mean, that's something that I think is inherently have is us being humans. I, no, absolutely. And one of the things that you said in that, uh, that I really resonate with is that as a man of faith um you don't have to believe like i believe my my purpose is to to serve you like like with our backpack program i want all of our children to be fed right I, regardless of faith color persuasion whatever i i want i want all of everyone in our community to to have the same opportunities to have the same um experiences uh that we can all have and i think that, like you're saying the key to that is the what's that saying about seek first to understand then to be understood it's you oh here right. i am lord yep absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um so so what uh what took you into law and into politics into to public service uh was there something that that led you down that road so and this is the, okay so i do miss being in person and having meetings in person but I get to show people now why I even went down this crazy road of becoming a lawyer. This book right here. <laughs> this book is from 1964. <laughs> <laughs> you can see some of the pages, everything else. It's getting up there, right there as well. Um, this book, The Kennedy Years and the Negro. I saw this book on my parents' nightstand when I was four years old. Now, as a kid, I was really shocked when I saw this book. So I was thinking to myself, wow, my parents have a book with a bad word on it. It says Negro. What's going on over here with that as well? And so I'm flipping through the pages. And obviously, I see, you know, JFK. And I flip through the pages. I see MLK at that point. You know, he'd only passed away, you know, in 1968. So, you know, it hadn't been that long, about 12, 13 years or so. But there's another guy that kept on popping up in the pages. And the guy that kept on popping the pages is this guy right here, Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> and I asked my parents, I said, well, who's this guy? He said, his name's Thurgood Marshall. And I said, okay, so, you know, what did he do? Well, he was big in the civil rights movement. He's one of the reasons why we were able to have the rights and, you know, where you're able to go to school and what you're able to do today. I said, okay, so, well, how did he do that? Well, he, he's a lawyer. And, you know, advocate people. So what do lawyers do? They help people. And I said, okay, I want to be a lawyer. 36 years later, I, wow. I never changed. And that's, I mean, this is this, but it's funny what influences in your life. But it was this book that made me think, okay, I want to be a lawyer. Lawyers help people? Okay, cool. I want to do that. And maybe, you know, some people might say it's naivete per se, but uh, that's, that's the way I approach it is that, hey, problem solving. You help work to figure out solutions. Um, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the lawyers. I thought that was cool that you get to go and advocate people in the courtroom. You get to speak for people who not necessarily are, are represented. And you get to make mm -hmm. a difference. And, you know, I, you know I, and I always thought to myself, you know, especially remember I told you my mom, chemistry, and my dad, um, engineering. So I'm the, I'm the weird bird. <laughs> you know, I had everybody with that. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to be able to go ahead and speak, talk, um, make a difference. And I, I just kind of thought this was the way, you know, you're supposed to be, you know. 
it, it, it's, it's not enough to just speak about things and, and try to, to make a difference. You got to actually go ahead and take action to it to do so. And you know, that's, that's really, that's really cool. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, of course, was a huge influence in the, the changes in our country, the tra trajectory of our country, right? Um, we, we lean a lot on, on what he did. Um, and it's interesting that he first wanted to be a dentist and then applied, then, then went down that law school path. There's always a kid in, in school that argues with everybody. And the joke is, oh man, you're going to be a lawyer, right? Now you're not argumentative at all. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is when you're in court, you're referred to as counselor, right? Yes. So that idea of being a counselor, of helping people, of giving them advice and helping them navigate situations for, you know, for the betterment of themselves, I think is something that's really integral about law that I think a lot of people overlook. Boy, you know, Tom, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I think people forget that a um, counselor and attorney at law is what is, I mean, that's, that's what it is. And, you know, when I speak to clients all the time and I'm, you know, helping them help with their specific issues, I advise them say, hey, listen, this is a better path. Let's do this. You know, I can argue, hey, I'm, I, you know, I'm your attorney. I can litigate, <laughs> get out of the court and do whatever you want. But maybe we should look at this solution right here as well. Or, you know, even now we've gotten to the point where I've um, been pretty blessed that Trump, the clients trust me, where even before litigation, before lawsuits even occur, I'm saying, hey, why don't you allow for me to sit down with the opposing attorney or the other party and let's try to see if we can resolve things, you know? Uh, you know, we call them alternative dispute resolution, ADR practices. But, you know, I, I just, I, if you, if you got to, if you got to litigate, you got to be zealous advocacy, you can do so and you can do so in a respectful fashion. I've done it on numerous occasions. But if you can find common sense solutions, you know, that, that is, I think, you know, you, you're winning the battle more often than not when you're doing that. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, as attorneys, I feel like that's our role. Our role isn't just to go ahead and say, hey, listen, we're going to go to the courtroom on this. Hey, listen, what, what can we do to make a difference and help us out? So great point. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you're right. Those common sense solutions are not always common practice, right? Uh, we, we, we get into yeah. those situations and what turns out to be common sense just it, is not commonly practiced. Um, and you know this, uh, when I meet someone, especially when I meet somebody new, I, I have the tendency to ask them, hey, what's your superpower? Which is kind of code for how are you making a difference in the world? So, uh, so th I've got a, a few ideas, but I, I kind of want to know, what do you think? What's your superpower? What do you see your, your uh, superhero power is? Oh, man. Um, that's a good question. I, I still laugh uh, <laughs> when you're talking about the kids who, talk, who argue a lot in school. I wasn't necessarily the kid who always argued a lot and debated, but I was definitely the kid who would have straight A's. And then when it says speaking in class, I got an N for needs improvement. <laughs> Every single time. Really? Yeah, I always, I always love talking. You know, I love talking to everyone with that. It's, 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 it's funny how that goes. He just reminded me of that. Uh, my coach would always be like, we know what your grades are going to be. Are you still speaking in class? I'm like, oh. <laughs> but regarding superpower, I think I have an ability that – um, I've been blessed with to bring people together. I think that's something that um, I have a unique ability to, to relate with people. I think that part of it is to be frank, you know, where I grew up in the small North Texas town trophy club, where Argyle, Justin, Roanoke is the Roanoke's yeah. the big town right next to me over here. And people who know Roanoke, Texas, yeah, you know, the, you know, the area right there when Keller was about as podoc as anything, um, you know, I, we were the only black family there. We were the only black family, you know, you know, in the area, one of two. And yet, you know, we related and worked with one another all the time on a regular basis, played with each other, you know, church together. It's perfectly fine. And I understand the rural, how, you know, rural America is, you know, you know, the, the, the mindset, the ideas, you know, I, I think that makes a big difference. Um, I'm also the same person when I had the opportunity to, um, take a job after clerking from one of the major law firms, um, Fulbright and Jaworski, when I was 20 years old, I took it as a transportation worker around campus to move furniture, break down bleachers, um, you know, you know, take out tr trash, do everything else and work from there. And, you know, I wanted to do that because I, I wanted to get another perspective, another viewpoint. And I can't, I, I think that job 
may have taught me more about how the world works than anything else. You know, the way people looked at me wearing that at UT, you know, when the transportation workers, you wear a brown, you wear a brown jumpsuit, you know, right, you know, having your gloves, moving stuff, taking care of those things. And, um, and then, and then the reaction from the people I worked with who were like, Rudy, you know, we're really excited that you're with us. We, we think that you're going to end up, you know, having a great career. You're one of us. You make us proud. And I always told them, hey, if you need anything, work and, you know, difference. I mean, these people are just salt of the earth, good folks. And I think that oftentimes in life, I think the worst thing that can happen is not despise someone, but not see someone. You know, when you just go ahead and you ignore them, you know, you know when we talk about people suffering from homelessness, when we're talking about issues, concerns about people who aren't feeling um, heard or felt in society, they just don't feel like they're a part of society. They don't feel like they have a voice or, or respect it. And I think that um, we need to remember you know, every time I go to the courtroom, here's a perfect example. Every time I go to the courtroom or go to the courthouse, I always say hi to the clerk. I always say hi to the bailiff, you know, you know, the runner or anything else, the intern and stuff. Because, you know, they're all people and they're all part of the system to make it great. And I think that we got to remember that when we're talking about people in general is that uh, we're all people and we've all got our own stories. And, you know, and, you know, talk to people, learn their stories, learn that their what thoughts are and reactions. Yeah. I, I, I think that's great. I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that because there's a, you know, my, my granddad used to say, you would, you treat the waiter just as if you would treat the same way as you treat the president, right? You, you treat everyone with respect and dignity. Um, talking with Chief Blado this last week, we were talking about, I was talking about with her about some of the same things about uh, leadership and diversity and how Pflugerville is such a diverse place uh, to serve and to, to help build your community. There's a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm sure that as a councilman, because I've, I've watched a lot of council meetings, especially this year, uh, that, that provides some real challenges to, to try to lead and do what's best for the greatest number of people in the city. Uh, but it also provides a lot of great opportunities. Our diversity is a strength. Could you Give us a little insight I mean, from, a, uh, from your perspective, a leadership perspective. What are those challenges? What are those opportunities? How can we best navigate that? You know, Tom, I like the way you put it best when you said that challenges and followed up by opportunities. Because, I mean, that's what I think. I think every challenge is an opportunity. And, you know, we think about it. We went from a small um, white German town to a majority minority population of you have about what 75 80,000 in the city another 35 or so in each EJ so about 100 110,000 people you know overnight and the things that you just brought up I'm sure the chief highlight is that the issues that you've seen you know in other areas that are around the country that you know that follow that either protest rioting etc this was you don't see that here but you don't see that here because people made it a point to make sure that, you know, just because we grow, the values don't change, that you, you, you appreciate people for who they are and you welcome people for who they are and you make a external difference in their values. You know, it definitely is tough, you know, at times trying to balance what things need to be in a budget, um, you know, you know what, what we're gonna effectuate, what roads need to be built, um, you know, some of, the, some of the issues in general that we're facing, you know, right now, especially, I mean, Let's be honest, nobody gave us a playbook for a pandemic. But I think one of the greatest things that we've seen is just how we've rallied around one another. But, you know, and, and that's been really, really interesting. And, and when I say, you know, us, that includes to me, that's not just the, the city, that's not just the school district, but community leaders like yourself and the faith-based communities, you know, working with one another, you know, to make a difference in these things. I mean, and I even encourage that. I'd say that with our elected officials, one of the things that, you know, Jeff Trevelyan is a friend and mentor of mine I've known for close to 20 years, you know, and um, he's our local, you know, our commissioner for, you know, Precinct One. I, I mean, literally the day after we announced we were closing things, he, he got together with us saying, okay, listen, what do we need to focus on what we need to do? And we looked at trying to make sure that the kids, because a lot of kids, as you know very well, backpack friends, get their food, you know, from the school. So what are we doing to work with, you know, some such as food banks, these aspects to try to see what we can make a difference to make sure, you know, people aren't going hungry. 
What are we going to do about people who, um, who are the seniors and they're lonely and they're not able to go ahead and access areas right there to, to, to get foods, get out of their house, to make sure they stay safe, to make sure that they, they still feel like they're appreciated and loved. Working with, you know, um, Sarita and, you know, it, it, you know, Lacoste and senior access and making sure that's good stuff. Looking with our local businesses. I mean, HEB, I, I can't tell you enough how happy, I mean, I mean, you talk about people put it, you know, practice what they preach, you know, working with us regarding getting senior hours organized together, making sure that, you know, people earning their stores were doing so in a, a safe fashion. A lot of the things that needed to get done, they were dealing with that. And then when we ultimately had, you know, you know, several months ago, the, the murder of George Floyd in front of this country, people asked me, they're like, you know, wait, so I don't understand. Why aren't people in Pflugerville acting, you know, as if other in other places around the country, you know, regarding law enforcement, why do they have that relationship? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because years ago, years ago, um, Chief Blade and others laid the foundation of true community policing. And when true community policing means that, you know, you know the officers in your community. The officers in your communities know you. They're there as community servants with a servant's heart, and they're there to make a, a big difference. And so when, pe you know, it, it always agitated me to hear people saying the narratives, well, people of color just don't like police, don't get along with police. And I, and I challenge them every single time because, you know, I, one of the things that I've been working on, and you know well enough, is talking to law enforcement, um, you know, associations and agencies across um, the state, trying to see what we can do to bring people together and make discernible change. I tell people, I live in the community where, you know, you have a police force that's probably about 87, 88% white, um, majority minority community, but it has a 95% approval rating because true community policing happens. So don't tell me that these things can't happen. It takes work. Because like you said, there, it may be a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And laying that foundation and working with another, that makes such a big, big difference. You know, we had the equity commission. We created the equity commission long before the murder of George Floyd. We were saying, well, we want to get this done organized because we have a majority minority community. And we didn't just want people, uh, different people of uh, ethnic groups or races, seniors. What are we hearing regarding our other population, regarding our services? What are they looking like? Are we really affecting helping them? Veterans, one out of every five family, you know, in Pflugerville is either, you know, is a family of a veteran. And so, you know, what are we doing to help that? Those things, can be challenges because you have different, you know, ideas and concepts, different groups. But you know what? I really have found there's a commonality with them, and it's it's really service and working with one another. And I think that if you go with that mindset, that's you know, again, much more made th things much more common than not. That just it allows for you to to have a broader perspective regarding what you can do and how you can make a difference. Yeah, you know, there's a uh, I'm a Ken Burns fan, ah, so. There is a uh, a documentary, it's like 16 and a half hour long documentary called Country Music, right? Where he, he just kind of goes through this whole, I mean, it's, if, if you're not into music, it's a beating. But if you are, then it's, it's uh, I love it. But he talks about the quote, and I think you referenced it at one point, that uh, he says in that documentary that we are all from different races, but, from a specific race, but we are all of the human race. One of the great things I love about our community I grew up, I don't know if you know this, I grew up in Southeast Texas, Southeast Houston. Uh, very different climate culturally than Pflugerville is. But my kids have grown up here. And so when I walk out my front door, we have a, 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 a biracial family to one side of us in the house next to us. We have an Asian family to the other side. We have an African-American family diagonally over here. We have a white family here. We have a Korean family here. And on Saturday, everybody's out in the driveway together. And that's not a, that's not a special occasion. That's not a, you know, that's not a unity rally or a parade. That's Saturday. That's just, they have grown up that way, right? That's, that's who we are. So um, one of the things that we talk about with Backpack Friends and with our activist group is that we say leadership isn't about being in charge. It's about caring for those in your charge. That's something that I think you model for us. I think that's something that you embody. So for leaders in the community, uh, and to be honest, people from around the world are, are, will be watching us and our, our impactivist tribe. We've got people in Johannesburg, we've got people in Germany, we have people from all over the globe who are plugged into this. Um, so 
is, is there advice that you would give them um, as far as how, how to make a difference in their community? If they want to lead the people that surround them, if they want to care for those in their charge, um, are there some rules of engagement that you would suggest uh, that they do, that they follow? You know, I, I definitely would go with, hey, God, that's, that's, that's wonderful. And you, you, not to go too much on a tangent, but I gave a speech for Black History Month. I got invited to Henderson High School to give a speech in Black History Month um, this past February, which like, that seems like a lifetime ago now, right? <laughs> Given the right, time. right. And one of the things I emphasized to the students was this, is that um, they live in a very unique, atypical community for this country but it doesn't have to be that way. And that wherever they go, you know, live their lives, go to college or something like that, they have become ambassadors of our city and of our region. And they take with them, just like you said, the teachings, the guidance, the upbringing that goes along with them. And so they're the ones who can go ahead and go into other areas and say, no, it doesn't have to be this way. I live in a community that's this way. Wait, why do you do that? Because I live in a community that's not like that. You know, and, and, and challenge things, embrace things, make, be agents of change. Because I really do believe that it's, it's that upbringing, that mindset that is, is what's gonna make a difference and change in our, in our, our country in general and, and in the world. Um, I truly believe that, you know, I, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, is that, that people are inherently good and they want to see good, assume the best in people that they're, um, you know, a, you know, and then you can always prepare for the worst, but you assume the best in people, you know, you can always do that. That's fine. I can, I can understand that. Um, look to, look to serve as opposed to be served. That's something that, you know, I, I think that I, I remind, I told the students this and I'll remind everyone here again, elected officials, they work for you. I work for you. I, you know, I, I am there to go ahead and make a difference on your behalf. That's my job. My job is to make a difference on your behalf right there. You know, hold people accountable. Make sure that, you know, they, know, you know, that you, just like you said, watching these council meetings, looking at things, um, that people understand that, that, hey, yeah, wait a minute, you work for me, what's going on here? I want to understand that and have them explain and work through things for that, because that's very true. Um, embrace um, the unknown. I think that that's something that I've done in my entire life, which has been, uh, you know, interesting to say the least, the, the places that it's led me um, to where I am today, uh, you know, it's made a big difference. You know, there, there's, it's okay to be scared, but it's not okay for just being scared to stop you from doing something, make a difference, you know, overcome, overcome that, walk with that. Um, hey, every time I give a speech, every time I'm in court, I tell people all the time, we're always very nervous. Just like, you know, in a football game. Like, I would tell people every time before, when the football game kicks off, I would, I, I would be so nervous and everything else organized. And after that, oh, get that first hit. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm ready to roll. All right. <laughs> Let's get organized. I'm, I'm with that. You know, I feel like that's this life in general with that. You know, I think people are, are worried about sharing their concerns, of, um, their issues, their apprehensions embrace those emotions embrace that impact because they're it, it, it's amazing how you sharing your story your life your issues and concerns can make a difference in others like that um, I, i've seen that more and more particularly during this pandemic where i've seen people talk about uh, the, the psychological you know you know issues they've had for being away from people you know, and how that's impacted their daily commutes and daily lives. You know, people are by nature, you know, habitual, they're going to have it. We were, you know, like our rituals and everything like that. When you, when you take somebody else from that ritual, that makes a big difference in what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the transformation of our society. I mean, look what we're doing right now. You know, I'll tell you right now, I did not expect a year ago I'd be embracing Zoom. <laughs> and, you know, and, and Microsoft Teams and all these other things as well as we have. And, you know, you see people adapt. And I mean, and that's the thing is that what's so great about, you know, people in general is that we can adapt. We can have that ability to do so. We just got to be open to change and open to that, that reason, and open to that mindset that, you know, it, it, you're always learning. And, you know, you've got to remember that. 
And, and if, there any, if there's any students or young people watching, I want to say this too as well. You're always interviewing, you just don't know. You know, if any, <laughs> you know, you know I, I'm telling you, you know, even listen to what Tom had to say about all the things he said about me even before we, we started the discussion. I did all those things, had no idea, <laughs> you know, anyone's watching because you just, you just, like I said, you just do it. But always remember that you're always interviewing. You just don't know it. That's a hundred percent, man. We can, and maybe, maybe it's because you and I have enough miles on us now. We can look back, and we've got a little hindsight, uh, right? We realize that. Um, hey, before before my last question, tell people where they can uh, connect with you. Where can they follow you? Where can they see uh, all, all the things that you're up to? Um, so you know, I have my Twitter handle R M E T A Y E R. R M E T A Y E R. You can always find me on Facebook, Rudy Matera, always make friends, always wanting to hear things. Um, my LinkedIn page, um, you can find me on that. And, you know, I, I am under Instagram, Rudy Matera. <laughs> I don't post nearly as much as I'd like to on there as well. That's fine. But I, I, do, I do have me, I, I will say this, I've, I, I started to, to write more on Medium. And I've started to use that to, to write more, just, you know, get some of my thoughts out there. You know, I think that one of the things that's been really great about um, one of the good resources, things that have come back from this pandemic is, is self-reflection and being able to um, take an opportunity to breathe, reflect, and look at things, um, you know, from either a different lens or just over, look at things, just like you said, Tom, about, you know, perspective in general with that. I think that we don't do enough time, we don't have enough time for that in our society. Often we're always just go, 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 et cetera, right there. So, You've got to take time to reflect um, be yourself and, and look and see what you can do to make a difference. And honestly, what you can do to improve. You know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that you know, <laughs> we're talking about, <laughs> one of my favorite books, Strength Finders. <laughs> yeah. You know, look and see, which find out what your strengths are, you know, and work from there. And there's also another book called Mindset, which I really, really love. And it talks about how the shortcuts that we make in our own minds and how that's created and honestly how it can be detrimental at times because of that and how we can overcome that to go ahead and get over some of our apprehensions and fears and things that we have in our life. That's great. That's not a uh, Carol Dweck, is it? Mindset? Oh, look at you. Boom. That's exactly is that... <laughs> There you go. Look at you, you man. Go. Look at there you. you. Go, One of my favorite books. Yeah. Change my change my perspective, man. I, I have enjoyed this. Like you, you don't you don't even understand. Um, but last question is: If you could have a billboard, you could have one message, one tweet, one Facebook post, whatever that would go out for the world to see. Uh, what would be your message to the world? What would you want to say to the world? You can you can disagree without being disagreeable. Here here's something that really changed my life. And my parents said this to me when I was nine years old. So I'm sitting there watching uh, the Knicks were playing the Bulls, you know, and all of a sudden a, a commercial comes on on NBC. My parents are in the other room doing Bills. And I say, wow, I can't believe that racist is on TV. I can't believe he's on TV. My parents are like, what are you talking about? I was like, that racist. They, they give that racist his own TV show. And he said, what are you talking about? They come to the room. Well, it was a commercial for the TV show In the Heat of the Night. And um, you had Carol yeah. O'Connor, you know, uh, you know, Carol O'Connor, you know, over there as well, playing an officer in that show. And I said that bigot, I can't believe that bigot is on TV. And what my parents did was they took the remote, turned off the TV, sat on either side of me. And I said, Rudy, do you know what our favorite TV show was when we first came to this country? And I said, no, what was it? I said, all in the family. And I said, all in the family. And you know, for your, the younger people watching, they have no idea what all the is right there. Right, you know? YouTube it, right. Yeah, there you go. Um, I was like, why would you watch a show with a racist on it? And you know, all these characters, that's just absolutely horrible. What's going on here? Um, and they said, Rudy, Carol Connor took that role because he knew it was an important role because they, they knew they had to talk about racial issues in this country and they were trying to figure out a way to do so to disarm people and make a difference. And they figured that using comedy would be a good vehicle to do so. So they decided, you know, they created the show and they used, you know, comedy as that. 
he knew going in that some people were truly going to think that he was Archie Bunker. And it wasn't going to just be that way during the show's lifetime if Russ was like that, but he knew it was an important role. And they said, Rudy, that was the last time this country had a, a honest conversation about race. And my parents told me that in 1989. And so, you know, that viewpoint, those ideas, that mindsets, you know, thinking that everyone has their stories. And you've got to understand that everyone's story is their life. They've lived their life. So if you give someone a viewpoint or idea that's antithetical to what they've, they've experienced, they're going to be shocked by it because it's going to be like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's not the way I see the world. I, I've lived this world. What are you talking about over here with that as well? And we've got to have the grace to people to, to say to them, hey, listen, I get it. This is shocking you. This is brand new information. I completely get it. But I'm telling you this because this is my story. And I want you to hear my story, my perspective, so we can go ahead, we can have a more enriched viewpoint and ideas and concept about what's going on and going on with life. And I don't think that we understand or respect people's stories enough. And then I don't think that enough people take the time to digest and truly actively listen to other people's stories and then take that and incorporate into their own. And I think that if we did do that, if we did go ahead and, and understand that everyone has their stories, learn and embrace theirs. Anyway, I'd say everyone has their own stories, so learn and embrace um, them. That would be a very big difference in what's going on with that. So maybe something yeah. on that. Maybe something about embracing. You know, everyone has their stories. Embracing that. That's a good. That's a you know, <laughs> learn and embrace. I don't know, but yeah, yeah I've never I never had to ask that billboard question. That's a really good. Uh, there's so much I would want to say. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Maybe it's as simple as people are good. Let's work together. <laughs> hey, impactivist, before you go. Listen, uh, what's one thing that resonated? What's one takeaway that you can pull from this time together? Uh, I don't know if it's maybe something that has to do with uh, leadership or community service, whatever that is, please put that in the comments below. We would love for you to be part of the conversation that continues. If you haven't hit the subscribe and the notification buttons to this, please do that as well. And if you're not a part of our Facebook group, Impact this Facebook group, hop over there and join that group. It's free, nobody's selling anything. We just want to do what we can do to work together to make the world the best that it can be. We would love for you to be a part of that. Join us, we will see you over there, and we'll see you soon. Oh my gosh, that was good.